Policy and Politics of Payment Models. This session is for the Learning Health Systems Rehabilitation Research Network and CoSTARS Virtual Institute on Rehabilitation Payment Models. Hi, I'm Justin Elliott, Vice President of Government Affairs at the American Physical Therapy Association. And hi, I'm Heather Parsons. I'm the Vice President for Federal Affairs at the American Occupational Therapy Association. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about the policy and politics up on Capitol Hill when it comes to federal legislation dealing with payment models and payment reform. So first, let's look at who are some of the stakeholders on the provider side who are part of any discussion or debate when it comes to payment reform legislation on Capitol Hill. Any discussion on payment reform will often have the AMA, the American Medical Association, front and center in that discussion, and what is often referred to as the House of Medicine, which encompasses the broad constituency of the various physician groups that are part of the AMA. Groups representing primary care physicians, uh, the various surgical specialists, uh, specialties like orthopedic surgeons, radiology, pathology, cardiologists, rheumatologists, etc. And of course, there are the non-physician provider groups, groups such as AOTA, APTA, and ASHA. And then there are also groups such as the American Healthcare Association, which represents uh, skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities, and often have a number of these providers working in those facilities. And of course, with any debate on payment reform, the big question is whether the interests and goals of these various provider groups will align, thus having a united front, or will there be divisions? You know, for example, I think there is united consensus by all healthcare provider groups that MIPS program under Medicare is, is broken, it's overly burdensome, and it's not working exactly uh, how it was supposed to be. But what is the fix? And can we all agree on what that fix should or should not be? Uh, in addition, it's important to remember when talking about payment reform and payment legislation, there is a limited number of resources, i.e. money. So it's a big question of how will we divide up uh, this, uh, divide up this uh, pieces of pie when it comes to uh, payment legislation. From a federal agency perspective, uh, the centers from uh, CMS is front and center. And they will often provide the data that influences the direction of a policy, as well as provide what's known as technical assistance on legislation in terms of how it would need to be written uh, appropriately to ensure it can be operationalized. And of course, they will provide their opinion. You know, other entities that can influence payment legislation uh, are groups such as uh, the Centers, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, CMMI, uh, including what are some of the models that have come out of CMMI, as well as what are some of the models that have not been approved uh, by CMMI. And of course, the various reports and recommendations uh, from, from MedPAC uh, can drive and sometimes are the spark uh, that creates policymakers to formulate legislation related uh, to payment reform. Now, understandably, most members of the United States Congress um, are not experts on healthcare and, and healthcare payment issues. Um, they don't have that in the weeds knowledge uh, on specifics on payment models or necessarily are ex experts on how payment models impact the various provider groups. I'd say that with a couple exceptions. Of course, there's what's known as the DOC caucus uh, uh, in, in Congress. And these are the members of Congress who are healthcare providers, physicians, folks like Congressman Larry Bouchon from uh, Indiana, uh, Congressman Ami Berra from California. These are members who are physicians who have a very in-depth knowledge uh, in terms of payment and uh, provider impact. And of course, there are members of Congress who have had personal experience uh, with health issues and with the healthcare system, or maybe perhaps family members who have had issues, health issues that also have provided them insight into uh, the into healthcare issues. But it should be noted that again, in general, most of them do not have that in the weeds uh, knowledge. Now, every pretty much every office up on Cap Capitol Hill will have a staffer who uh, works on healthcare issues, known as the Health LA. And these staffers, you know, have that more familiarity with the healthcare issues since. They are tasked with managing that portfolio. But keep in mind, the healthcare portfolio on Capitol Hill is pretty broad, dealing with everything from Medicare to Medicaid uh, to prescription drugs, you name it. So they have a, a large breadth of issues that they have to manage, but and sometimes they don't necessarily have the depth of the issues because of the complexity of all the issues on, on the radar. Uh, and sometimes that healthcare staffer who's the Health LA is assigned to multiple issues, not just healthcare. They sometimes have to ha handle healthcare and transportation. But when you get down to it, healthcare is really driven by four main committees of the US Congress, two committees in the House and two committees in the Senate. And these four committees are often referred to as 
the four corners. Uh, these committees are also provide different perspectives on how to move forward on healthcare. For example, the House Energy and Commerce Committee and the Senate Health, Education and Labor and Pensions Committee known as the Senate Help Committee are often more focused on the policy of the healthcare issue at hand, while the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee are more focused on the cost, how much a policy will cost or could, it, could a policy potentially save uh, money. Now, while the members who, of Congress who sit on these committee, committees often have more familiarity and knowledge on healthcare issues, since they, obviously they're on the committees of jurisdiction that manage uh, healthcare, the drivers of the policy specifics when it comes to legislation are often the committee staff uh, who serve on these four committees. These are the staff who are in the weeds policy experts on these healthcare issues and often are the ones guiding the legislative text and what policies will or will not be part of a package. You know, it's one thing to note, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we look at forecasting of the 2022 midterms, is that when there is a shift in power up on Capitol Hill, whether it's the Republicans taking over the House or vice versa, uh, not only do the chairs of these committees switch over, but there's often a changeover in the committee staff. And so that can have a huge impact in terms of historical knowledge on why an issue was done a certain way. So for example, most of the committee staff who worked on the Impact Act back in 2014 are no longer there. And also uh, the therapy cap repeal, which was back in 2018, a number of the uh, staffers who served on these four committees and were part of the discussion and negotiations on the therapy cap also are no longer on those committees. So that also can have an impact. Now let's look at who are some of the po power players on these committees. Of course, on the House Ways and Means Committee, the current chair is Congressman Richie Neal, Democrat from Massachusetts, and the uh, ranking member is Kevin Brady, Republican from Texas. On the House Energy and Commerce Committee, you have Chairman Frank Pallone, Democrat from New Jersey, and Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, Republican uh, from Washington. Now, in terms of elections mattering, obviously this November, if the Republicans do take back the House, that means there will be cha changes in chairs for both of these committees. Now, what's interesting, it should be noted that if the Republicans were to take back the House, if uh, Kevin Brady would likely become the new chairman, but he is retiring. And so that means that there will need, there'll be a, need to be a, a new chair for this committee. And there's already campaigning behind the scenes uh, by three Republican members of the House who would like to become the new chair of Ways and Means uh, should, uh, should the Republicans take back the House. And of course, on energy and commerce, Kathy McMorris Rogers uh, would be uh, first in line to become the new chair of House Energy and Commerce Committee. In the Senate side, uh, obviously we have a currently we have a Senate 50-50 split with Vice President Kamala Harris serving as the tie-breaking vote, but the Democrats are in charge of the committees. And so on the powerful Senate Finance Committee, you have Senator Wyden, a Democrat from Oregon, and uh, Senator Crapo from Idaho, who's the ranking uh, member. And of course, on the Senate side, you have Senator Patty Murray, Democrat from Washington, and Senator Richard Burr, Republican from North Carolina. Now, again, if the Republicans uh, take over the Senate in the midterms, uh, Senator Crapo from Idaho would become the new chair. Now, what's interesting, what will be interesting to watch is on Senate help, Congress, I mean, Senator Richard Burr is retiring, so he will not be the new chair uh, of Senate help. And the next person in line to be chair on Senate help would be Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. So that will be an interesting uh, situation to watch should the uh, Republicans take back uh, the Senate uh, in November. And of course, when it comes to the decision making, uh, in terms of what elements are going to ultimately be put in a legislative package and which bills are going to get on the docket to actually be voted on by a chamber, whether the House or the Senate, all roads go through the chamber leaders. And of course, in the House, that is Speaker Nancy Pelosi. And her counterpart is Congressman Kevin McCarthy, a Republican from uh, California. Now, of course, in the Senate, it's Senator Schumer, Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, and Senator Mitch McConnell, uh, who is Republican from Kentucky. And, you know, obviously, I think the, the, it should be noted that the leadership, these four members that make up the leadership team, they really do work very closely with the committees of jurisdiction and their committees I and mean, their staff work very closely with committee staff in terms of formulating legislative packages and determining what goes, what doesn't go. And of course, uh, if there is a change in power uh, right now, as, uh, Kevin McCarthy would likely become the new uh, speaker, um, and Mitch McConnell would become the new Senate Majority Leader. And of course, that change in power, that change in leadership, 
impacts what will be priorities uh, in terms of healthcare legislation and uh, some of the reforms needed. So let's also quickly just look at and do a, reform, a forecast on the 20, upcoming 2022 midterms. Now, in terms of house race, uh, this chart shows uh, the midterm election results uh, in the for the House uh, as compared to the uh, party of the sitting president. And historically, um, whatever party is in control of the White House loses seats uh, during the, the midterm election. And so, as you can see that historically, with the exception of three occasions, uh, the uh, party that is in control of the House, I mean, in control of the White House, will lose seats or usually loses seats during the midterm elections. And so right now, if history uh, stays true, there's a fairly strong chance that the Democrats will lose the House during the midterm elections. And right now, all current polling uh, shows that that is uh, the trend that is headed towards in November. Uh, similarly, in the United States Senate, same holds true in the Senate. Um, the power, whatever party is in uh, control of the White House, uh, typically and historically loses seats in the U.S. Senate. There have been five cases over the uh, last hundred years where that has not happened. But again, the vast majority of times uh, that does happen. And so again, looking at, uh, again, this, the very, uh, the 50-50 split in the Senate, Republicans only need to pick up one seat uh, to take control of the U.S. Senate. So that's a forecast. And of course, we'll be watching the uh, 2020 midterm elections and what that impact will have in the uh, efforts to reform healthcare and payment models in the 118th Congress that comes to DC come January, 2023. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Heather Parsons uh, with the American Occupational Therapy Association. Everything that he just shared really goes into how we look at legislation, what's coming up, what are opportunities for rehabilitation, what are threats to rehabilitative services, because really all of those committees, all of these elections affect what are priorities, um, what are policies that are going to be most likely passed during a Congress. There's two different sets of priorities between generally right now, if Democrats were in charge versus if Republicans were in charge. And so as we've seen in this Congress, Democrats have really prioritized trying to expand benefit coverage especially when it comes to um, Medicaid and the Medicaid coverage gap in non-expansion states. So places that didn't expand Medicaid during the Affordable Care Act, there's a coverage gap between the, where the marketplaces start and where Medicaid stops. They also were trying to expand hearing and vision benefits under Medicare and also looking to improve home and community-based services um, for people with disabilities living in the community or people who would prefer to age in the community. Um, a lot of that was also focused on direct, the direct care workforce and trying to make sure that we had a robust direct care workforce to handle increasing those home and community-based services. So if we did have a flip in Congress in November, um, these priorities would shift. And we know that the Republicans currently have put together working groups to really develop healthcare priorities that they plan on having those at the end of July. Like if, if they were to take the gavel, what would our priorities be? So we're waiting to see what those would be. And then we're gonna analyze those and look and see where opportunities um, to increase access to rehab services, to improve the overall health of, um, health of people within these programs. Um, and, and see how that fits with their priorities. Um, but Republicans have also said that they are interested in community-based services and reducing the so-called, what's called the institutional bias, trying to make sure that community services can be um, more widely accessed than they currently are. So Kathy McMorris Rogers, who's the ranking member on energy and commerce actually brought in extra staff to look specifically at this issue. So that's an issue that I think we will continue to see a focus on regardless of um, who is in charge. Similarly, um, there are other issues that I would say are nonpartisan that regardless of who is in charge in Congress, we're going to see a focus on. So mental health is one that currently the Senate Finance Committee is looking at um, bipartisan legislation if nothing gets passed in this Congress, I know that because of the mental health crisis we've seen during COVID, that will continue to be a nonpartisan focus. 
Telehealth is also something that both parties are very interested in making sure that we don't leave the public health emergency with no expansion of telehealth services. The fee schedule, which I'll talk a lot about next, those fee schedule fixes are also something that um, both parties equally don't wanna have to deal with, but also no need to be fixed is the best way that I can phrase that. It's, it's pretty tricky, but they know that the model of payment right now is not particularly working. And I'll talk more about why that's the case, um, that the quality measures, with an effort to, to have better outcomes, that that MIPS program, the QPP is not working, but they're also worried about Medicare solvency, right? Like we're still really coming up to that point where Medicare may no longer be solvent. Equally, both parties are interested in patient access, but this can be in very different ways. So um, on one hand, you may have a focus on rural access, and on the other hand, you have a focus on things like covering that Medicaid um, gap in the non-expansion states. So one of the issues that we've really been following closely are the Medicare payments. And Medicare payments are facing cuts from two, I would break it into two categories from two different fronts. So the first are budget neutrality requirements. Now these budget neutrality requirements only apply to Medicare Part B, so it's the physician fee schedule. And on the physician fee schedule, each year there's no increase in spending. So there's no inflationary increase, there's no money added to the system, unless Congress adds a new policy. So if Congress adds a new benefit, then the pie gets more money, but otherwise you have the same amount of money. This means that if one specialty gets an increase in their payments, that pie has to be rebalanced and basically everybody takes a cut in order to pay for that increase. Um, this really came into play several years ago when primary care physicians were given a big increase because it was widely viewed that primary care was underpaid for their services, that the physician fee schedule was um, paying too much for specialty care or for um, individual procedures than for that evaluation and management under primary care. So the primary care physicians were given an increase. Well, when they were given that increase, it caused therapy to get a dramatic decrease in the rebalancing that pie. But as we move forward, these budget neutrality requirements are gonna to continue to be a problem. So in an inflationary environment, if Medicare increases what they think, if they increase the expense portion of a payment for one specialty, more than they increase the expense portion of another specialty because of inflation, then they still have to rebalance that and you could end up getting a cut. So it's, it's really not a sustainable system. Additionally, we have some across the board, I just call them gimmicks. Um, others may have a more polite term for them, but I, these are congressional budget gimmicks or ways that they have paid for other policies in the past. And these apply to all of Medicare, so part A and part B. The first is called sequestration. This is a policy that went into place, it's like, it was a long time ago. It was um, probably six or seven years ago um, where there was a sequester where there was just an across the board 2% cut on all Medicare services in order to pay for other policies. When the public health emergency came in, Congress froze that sequester. So for two years, or for that first year, there was no 2% cut to services to help put money back into the system for a healthcare system facing COVID. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about where we stand with that now. The other is something called PAYGO. So this was, this was a budget decision also made about 10 years ago where Congress said, if we spend over a certain amount, if we spend too much without offsetting it, then it's going to trigger automatic across the board cuts across all of discretionary spending in the government. And so what they decided was that would be a 4% cut to Medicare, that they would cap it at that. So last year, we really were facing a 4% cut to all of Medicare. And on my next slide, we'll talk a little bit about what happened. 
So in 2021, because of all of these policies, we were facing a 9% budget neutrality cut, a 2% sequestration. And at that time, PAYGO was not an issue. But so really therapy services were looking at an 11% cut. After coordinated advocacy efforts across multiple medical specialties, that 9% therapy cut and cuts to other specialties ended up being reduced to a 3% cut and sequestration was moved to zero. So right there in the middle of the pandemic for 2021, we were able to, to avoid the biggest cuts. Then similarly in 2022, we were facing another 3.7% cut on top of a 2% cut for sequestration. And this time because of the COVID packages and the spending on COVID, PAYGO had been triggered. Um, so we were also facing a 4% cut. So at the end of last year, we were looking at a 9.7 potential cut for part B and a six, potential 6% 6 cut on part A. Um, you know, which also was not a time for these kinds of cuts. Ultimately, with the same coalition working together, that Part B cut was reduced um, to 0.75% for 2022. Sequestration was phased in. So really for this year, if you annualize the cut, it's gonna be 1.25% across the year. And PAYGO was delayed another year. But so looking forward, if I were to predict, so this is just my prediction, it's not, um, it's not a guarantee. I do think sequestration will be back in place at 2% in 2023. Congress really likes using this cut um, as a pay for. They keep adding a year to sequestration at the end of each 10 year budget window to get money now. Um, so I think this 2% cut is here to stay for a long, long time. On the other hand, I do think that Congress will get rid of PAYGO. They have the right to do that. They can just, in legislation, say, oh, and we waive PAYGO. In that case, you have to have, most likely you have to have a bipartisan agreement to waive it. Um, and so that may be the tricky piece, but I don't think that anyone's gonna let those cuts go into effect. On the case of budget neutrality, it really isn't sustainable. I think especially in this inflationary economy where costs are going up, you can't not put any more money into the system. So really Congress has to act to change this. And one of the issues is that it's gonna be very complicated. Justin showed all of the stakeholders, like getting all of them together to agree on a policy is going to be really tricky. Um, you know, and that's what we hear. What does the House of Medicine think? Have you all come up with an agreement? And you know, sometimes not all stakeholders have the same interests. So coming up with that agreement is gonna be really tricky. Um, we will need significant grassroots feedback to Congress. They have a lot of issues on their plate. They have a lot of things they can address. And this is just one of them. And we've been through several decades now of needing fixes to the Medicare payment. And so in some ways there's a real fatigue with this. So they have to be hearing from constituents and from grassroots that it's a problem. We are working together on therapy specific narratives about payment over the last decade. Our pay has basically been frozen since 2009 or even before, but we're just looking back to 2009. And, you know, usually we are put together with all the other healthcare providers. And so we think we need to really hold out what has happened to us specifically because of the therapy cut, because of other policies like the multiple procedure payment reduction that we do have, um, in some ways we're different. Um, but then we're also always looking for opportunities to improve health outcomes, right? Like how can therapy improve health outcomes? How can we help the system in both those traditional and non-traditional settings to in some ways make up for these challenges, but also to move the health of the country forward. Finally, I wanted to touch really quickly on post-acute care. I know our colleagues in regulatory talked a lot about current post-acute care payment issues. Um, and so I thought it was worth mentioning where Congress was on these issues. So to be honest, in Congress, there is really little focus on post-acute care. Um, there was a focus related to COVID response, making sure that in 
a COVID world, that these post-acute care settings could continue to function, that um, there were still providers, and that there were flexibilities to continue to provide care, and as well as finances and resources. So Congress did focus on that. COVID also brought about a focus on the fact that people would prefer to receive services in, in their home instead of in institutional settings. So we have seen introduction of legislation such as the Choose Home Care Act, which is a bipartisan bill that's been introduced in both the House and the Senate that would essentially provide SNF levels of care in the home. Now that bill has a long ways to go before it's passed into law. So I don't want to imply that it's something that's like ready to be signed into law right now, but it certainly came, came in as a bill of interest that really showed the focus on providing services more in the home. Um, but honestly, there's really no momentum on post-acute care payment reform. So we know in the IMPACT Act, that was really driving forward this uni like unified PAC payment system. So the committee staff who were really keen on creating a unified post-acute care payment system have since left. Um, they may come back, they could be at CMS at some day, they could be somewhere else, but like the real drivers of those policies are no longer um, working for those committees. Um, additionally, we've had the recent implementation of PDPM and PDGM, which means that we've seen some reform. Um, and so that, that kind of settles it. Um, I mean, you know, like Congress sees that that's taken effect. And so they're not really trying to drive further change. And they're satisfied with some of the changes in the Impact Act, the data is being, more data is being collected. So that still leaves some of the provisions of the Impact Act out there. Um, so under the Impact Act, CMS must submit to Congress a prototype for a unified post-acute care payment system based on patient characteristics, which is pretty much what PDPM and PD, PDGM did anyway. But they have to, to submit that to Congress next year. Now, the current data that they're using to develop that doesn't even take into account that PDGM happened or PDPM or that COVID happened. So they're really using bad data. But because the Impact Act said you have to develop this, they're continuing to develop it. Um, now, once they submit that to Congress, what Congress does with it, nobody really knows, right? So um, we're, we're sort of, we'll just be waiting to see, right? Um, and it will be our hope and we will really fight if Congress chooses to adopt a prototype that was based on bad data, that will become a real key fight for us um, because it will not be based on the, the best information. Currently, there is one piece of legislation called Resetting the Impact Act or the TRIA Act that says, hey, you got to start over again. Let's look at post-COVID data with these payment systems in place, essentially saying you need to start collecting data eight quarters after 2022 um, so that it would take two years to collect that data and then come up with a prototype. Um, I will say this isn't a congressional priority, but it's also a low cost, no cost. Um, it would just be the cost of CMS sort of waiting um, or having to do the study again. Um, it's a fairly low cost bill. So there is the possibility that it could pass um, depending on feedback that Congress gets from CMS on whatever prototype they develop. So we will be keeping a close eye on that um, in the future. And with that, um, that is it for this talk, but we are really excited to take your questions live um, in the future. And um, so yeah, think about what you'd like to ask us and we're happy to answer any questions.